and kind of a little bit more fun. We're going to just kind of take a break. We're going to think about like, okay, we know a bit about this technology now. What about the features, the benefits, and the unintended consequences? So kind of like, why should I care, right? Um, so just to kind of warm it up, we'll, we'll have fun. <laughs> just to kind of warm it up, um, we'll talk about some examples that are not blockchain, and then I have some blockchain examples. So a feature of the internet would be you know, TCP IP, HTTP, and the various protocols that kind of make up the web, UDP, all sorts of stuff, right? The benefit to that, to the world, is basically, you know, information exchange. It's now based essentially free to talk to anyone in the world, video conference, uh, share a photo, share a Google Doc. Um, so that's kind of the benefit to, to everyone. Now the unintended consequence might be that uh, what we've seen emerge is advertising and these walled gardens, like data silos, whatever you want to call them, um, are the dominant business models. So, you know, user data goes in and nothing comes up, right? Except for basically they're, you know, they're selling your attention to advertisers. So, um, smartphones, um, so wireless internet and photo, so basically uh, that's the feature. So we now got you know these really advanced things in our pocket. Um, what's one of the benefits? We can share uh, our experiences and moments and communication from anywhere in the world, right? So I can take a photo from the top of a mountain and I can send it to a family member. Um, but some of the unintended consequences: message and location privacy issues. We've seen this with Google. You know, every you know every six months, it's. Google's tracking anonymous Android location data even when it's turned off. Um, I think that was the most recent one. I don't know. All the headlines are blurring together with the privacy stuff. Um, so torrenting. So uh, you can now download files piecemeal thanks to uh, Bram Cohen and the BitTorrent protocol, right? Um, so that's a feature. You can smash a file into a bunch of pieces and you can shoot it out onto a, a network protocol and you can basically download these files piecemeal. That's a great feature. What's the benefit? Why should we care? It's faster downloads and it's re also reduced burden on the server. So you're now taking the load off the server and you're distributing it, right? And torrenting kind of feeds, some of the technology feeds into some of the blockchain projects. So uh, this is kind of like the segue into the blockchain features. Uh, what's the unintended consequence? Well, piracy and perhaps death. But let's talk about blockchain. So basically, uh, I'm going to go through six features of blockchain. So the first feature is it's public and it's permissionless. So that means it is open to anyone. Like I mentioned before in the technical overview, anyone can download a, bit, a Bitcoin client, uh, any piece of software. There's multiple different clients. As long as you can connect to the Bitcoin network and you can verify transactions, you're part of the network, right? So it's permissionless. You don't have to ask anybody to do this. It's an open protocol. You just connect. Same, same thing with Ethereum and a lot of the public blockchains. Um, and I'm, I'm talking in this talk mostly about public blockchains because they're the coolest. Um, so it's also the benefit to that is access to global markets. If, if I'm in Lithuania and I can't open a bank account that gives me access to PayPal, right? That means I can't sell stuff. Uh, I can't sell stuff to global markets. I mean, maybe you can in Lithuania, I don't know. But there's some countries in the world where you can't get access to a good bank account that can connect you to PayPal or Amazon or whatever. You're walled off, right? Why? Because they don't want to take the risk or whatever. Um, and one of the unintended consequences of these open networks, uh, of course, you know, dark markets, Silk Road, other stuff like that, right? Um, I'm not saying whether these are good or bad, by the way, the unintended consequences, so it's up to kind of interpretation, and I guess, you know, time will tell. Um, but let's look at blockchain feature number two. So it uses what's called pretty good encryption, or sorry, pretty good privacy encryption uh, for all accounts. So this is a public-private key pair, right? And then every transaction is signed by the private key, and your public key is how you would receive funds and how people prove that you were the one issuing that transaction. So 
Um, if you want to check out cryptography, it's another thing that's a bit beyond the scope of this, but check out PGP and just kind of go through a walkthrough of that if you want to, if you want to know what's, what it's all about. One of the benefits to somebody on the network would be there's no way to censor or hack transactions. Um, so basically, you might have heard of uh, Ethereum smart contracts getting hacked, and you might have heard of Bitcoin exchanges getting hacked, but it's really important to note and to separate sort of the, the type of attack. The Bitcoin blockchain, since it began in 2009, has never been hacked. The blockchain itself. Nobody has ever gone to a Bitcoin account and gone, you know, hey, I'll take your 100 Bitcoin and I'll move it over to this account without the entire network achieving consensus on that that was a valid transaction. So transactions since, you know, eight years have never appeared out of thin air. And it's the same way with the Ethereum network. But the code, the script running on top of the blockchain, of course, somebody writes a little smart contract, it's got a function exposed that shouldn't have been exposed to a non-owner, some kid goes in and bricks the entire smart contract, totally possible, right? Um, and in the Bitcoin world, it was the centralized exchanges. So these are exchanges that were custodians of blockchain accounts, right? And they were keeping these blockchain accounts unlocked so people could log in and, and transfer money. So these were, you can also call them hot wallets. Um, basically, those centralized exchanges, custodians of, of you know, hundreds of thousands of Bitcoins account, Bitcoin accounts, they've been hacked in the past. So just keep that in mind because it's, pretty, it's a pretty uh, fundamental um, feature and benefit of the blockchain. But of course, an unintended consequence could be funding illegitimate sources. So no nation state can come in and basically say, we don't like those guys, we got, you know, we got sanctions on them, we don't trade with them. Nobody can stop that, right? So blockchain feature number three, there is no central authority. Uh, I alluded to that by saying there is no bank of Bitcoin. If you lose your private key, uh, or you lose control over the recovery to your private key. So a lot of uh, wallets will encrypt your private key, give you a recovery phrase. If you lose your private key, you're toast. You can't, there's no bank you can go to and say, hey, here's my driver's license, here's my birth certificate, give me back my private key. There's nobody out there. Um, one of the benefits of that though, is that there's no arbitrary devaluation. Nobody can just print Bitcoins out of thin air, right? If you believe in, the Bitcoin distribution, which is 21 million um, till I think 2140, and it's sort of getting uh, halved at certain intervals. If you believe in that and you think that increased demand and a finite supply is a good thing, then you know that's what you believe in. That's how Bitcoin works. Uh, with Ethereum, there's no clear uh, upper limit yet on how much Ethereum will be generated, but uh, we'll probably see an announcement like one or two years. Um, and one of the unintended consequences to there being no central authority is that you have to get everybody to agree. So you gotta get miners, you gotta get exchanges. You get, like, if you're gonna do a fork of Bitcoin into uh, the recent ones like Bitcoin Cash and Bitcoin Gold, you need to have a certain amount of mining power behind you to create a whole new set of, a whole new chain, right? Um, and you also need to get exchanges on board to recognize this as a currency. Um, so there's upgrade politics and uh, even with the Bitcoin core protocol, it has been updated, but there's a lot of uh, politics involved there. So blockchain four, uh, this is feature number four. So everyone validates the entire chain. Um, so basically all nodes in the network, if they're full nodes, they eventually validate the entire chain. They can go all the way back to block zero and quickly compute uh, you know, what that account's balance is. And that's, uh, that's a great feature. The benefit is that it is fault tolerant. So nobody can kind of, like I said, you know, it's very hard for people to hack, uh, you know, 40,000 copies of a database at once and rewrite, uh, rewrite the past. Um, so the unintended consequence of that though is that the blockchain is huge. So these blockchains, uh, the actual ledger itself, like the, the Bitcoin blockchain is getting bigger and bigger. The Ethereum blockchain is a little bit 
it's a little bit more of a complex kind of blockchain with the smart contracts, so it is getting bigger at a faster rate, and they have to come up with some solutions for that. So uh, blockchain feature number five, you have visibility into all transactions. So although you know maybe some bad actors might think that Bitcoin is, is super anonymous, if you provide the right sort of AI or whatever, you can, you can quickly audit these accounts. So that's a benefit too. Uh, you can audit these accounts. These accounts can be externally audited without really having to kind of hand people a stack of invoices. So in double entry accounting, you know, we would have uh, credits and debits uh, maybe between a bunch of different companies. We'd have to have stacks of invoices and stuff and hand them to an external auditor. Here, you just tell them, you know, what are the accounts of interest and then they can just look at the blockchain and watch and check all the transactions. Um, but an unintended consequence, of course, would be privacy issues. If somebody tweets about their Bitcoin account or they're using that account for crowdfunding, for example, and it's connected to kind of a more personal account, it's very easy to kind of draw lines between these. There are uh, like anonymous currencies and stuff like Monero and Zcash, but again, I won't go into those. They're a little bit beyond the scope of this talk. Um, so a feature number six, this is the last one, guys. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, Basically, peer-to-peer -peer transactions. So, right now, if I wanted to send anyone in this room Canadian dollars directly, there's no way to do it. If I want to jump onto Amazon.com and I want to buy something right now, there's no way for me to directly give money to Amazon. It's got to be through somebody, right? It's got to be through a bank, interact transfer, whatever you call it, right? Credit card. Um, now that changes things because when I can send money directly and I actually hold my money because I'm the only one that has the private key to that account, then we can start to create, and this is the benefit, I'm getting a little bit kind of out there, meta on this, on this kind of talk, but it means that we can create networks of value around anything that we want to believe in. So it doesn't have to be the Canadian dollar, it could be something like Bitcoin or Ethereum, but it could be something totally different, right? So we can come up with new units of value as long as we can exchange them peer to peer and we can develop a tribe or a group or a community that believes in that. So another unintended consequence uh, is the end of rent seeking models. So basically rent seeking is an intermediary that kind of injects themselves in an economic transaction or in an economy and basically takes rent, like takes a cut of transactions, but doesn't really add value. So if we can do peer-to-peer -peer transactions, if I can pay Amazon directly and Visa doesn't get 3%, are we in a better place or a worse place than we were prior, right? So just something to think about. <clears throat> How am I doing on time? I have all the time in the world. Ah, uh, yeah. 